Good morning. It is a beautiful Saturday morning and today I am headed to an NPIP class. I'm going to take you along and we're going to discuss what is NPIP, how it affects us as breeders, what it means for selling eggs, and let's go. Alright, I got a little lost over here at Expo Square, but I think I found the building. My friend sent me her location and we should be in here. Let's go see what today holds. So we're going to kind of scat through these since this is Saturday. And then the test will take you guys a little while, so we'll just kind of go through and go through the slide presentation then after that we have a look because I think all of you guys can read I don't need to read everything uh, it's a cooperative between the states and USDA for national level all states are qualified and authorized testing agents to conduct the rapid whole blood testing for form and typhoid uh, established for uh, standards for poultry industry for breeding and for hatcheries Provisions can be changed to conform with new diagnostic te technology and development. And it's a voluntary program. You're not required to do it, but there's benefits if you do. Advantages for NPIP, easier movement of birds, better assurance birds are clean. You don't have to have your birds banded. Uh, one flock test per year, less testing, inexpensive products are worth more and you get a free listing in the NPIP directory. Did you bring in there? In 13. Uh, it's a rapid whole blood agglutination test and it's for salmonella pleurum and foul typhoid. I get my mouth working. I'm going to have to have some more coffee. Ana uh, antibodies from serum agglutinates with the antigen so you'll have a um, you'll have a purple stain which is the antigen and then when you mix it with the whole blood if there's a reaction, it'll clot up like there's a whole bunch of sand in there. Otherwise, it'll stay this pretty purple color. Uh, same species of bacteria allowed for a crossover, so you could have some false positives. Either disease will cause a positive reaction. Oh, wait, people have to be at the very front table. No, I'm just teasing. It's this blood test will pick up. Poultry diseases. You're going to find out that... Here's the symptoms of, of a disease. Most of these poultry diseases we're going to go over, they're all going to have this, this same kind of symptoms. Some will vary a little different than others. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, because pretty much they're all going to have the same. That's all we need to test for. Uh, here's the symptoms diseases. It's a bacteria, white diarrhea, or salmonella form. That's what it's white diarrhea. It's that's what they produce when they have the disease. Infectious. It's infectious. It's egg transmitted disease. Death loss primary and young. Incubation period in chicks two to three days. Adults 16 to 21. Death loss may be variable. Mostly in chicks you're going to have 100%. Once adults get exposed to it, you usually will not have much of a death loss, but they'll be uh, carriers. It's uh, hereditary because it, it can be passed through the eggs. Poultry, quail, pheasant, and sparrows are susceptible. It seems like guineas, ducks, and geese are resistant, and it is zoonotic. It can be transmitted to people. It can be spread, egg eating, egg picking, embolism, and fecal contamination. Chicks, Transmitted through the egg from the hen. Incubator, chicks are exposed when they're all in the incubator. Hatchery uh, equipment. Bacteria can live on and spread by shoes, clothing, farm animals, equipment, insects, and rodents. Flies can cover this form of in the intestinal tract for five days. Chicks. They'll be non-specific. Ticks can they show no signs before death. 
appear to have dips in water. They'll have sagging wings, head hanging, and ragged, or ragged feathers, whitish to green diarrhea, and labeled breathing. Warm diseases for the adults, they'll just have an increased appetite, uh, increased water consumption, usually due to a fever. They'll be have a pale cone and mucous membrane. You'll notice decreased egg production and feed efficiency. Survivors will look unthrifty. And they're chronic carriers, so they're going to carry it for life. You can't antibiotic it out of them. I mean, they're, they're just, they'll be carriers. Uh, this is called foul typhoid, which is Salmonella gularium. And typhoid has, a, has many of the same symptoms as the Salmonella pulmonary. It's egg transmitted, death loss may be moderate to very high. Incubation period varies depending on the variants of the bacteria. May last many months with several outbreaks. It's spread by hen to egg, chick to chick. More frequently transmitted among growing and mature birds and fecal droppings. And the same contaminated clothes, shoes, and equipment, and it's zoonotic too, so it can be transmitted to people which most like all salmonella is. This one's, these are no different. These are the symptoms of chicks. May be acute or chronic, increased thirst and loss of appetite, greenish to yellow diarrhea. They'll have a pasty vent. A lot of times those chicks will do it, especially if you get them shipped to you. It'll, they're naturally gonna have that, just from the stress of being hatched, being shipped, and usually if, they, if it clears out within a week, you should be fine if you don't have a death loss. Adults appear normal, increased thirst. You have a decrease in egg production. They'll have a high fever, ruffle feathers, greenish yellow diarrhea. Uh, mortality and incidence is usually higher in older animals and they're chronic carriers. OMG, Mycoplasma gustavia, With the weather just getting this rain, you're going to notice some birds are going to start showing these symptoms. Usually when we get sick bird calls, this is usually what it comes out when we have a huge change in weather. This was identified in 1943. It's a chronic respiratory disease, affects birds four, to four weeks and older, incubation is five months or longer. Durations one or more months. Spread, direct contact, bird to bird, eggs, airborne, dust or droplets, contaminated shoes and equipment. I like how all this is spread. Mycoplasma is very susceptible to heat, light, and most disinfectants. Symptoms, decreased egg production, decreased hatch, hatchability, and viability of chicks. Clinical, little cough, sneeze, rattle, sticky, ocular and nasal discharge. Young birds show more severe signs than adults. Northerners may show more severe signs than layers. MS is, was first uh, described in 1954. Primary affects growing birds, first four to 12 weeks of age. Direct contact, eggs, people, equipment. This one will more or less, the other one was more nasal. This is more joint. You'll have lameness, swollen hocks and foot pads. They'll sit down on the litter, depressed. You can find them around waters and feeders because they don't want to walk because they hurt. You'll have mild respiratory signs. You have a high morbidity but low mortality. Too far away. Avian influenza. This is the one we both have had a lot of experience with. I have within the last two years. Y'all have noticed your eggs are up, chickens are up. Well, we've killed a lot just because this disease is mainly has hit the uh, northern states. It's been from Utah all the way to Pennsylvania, Virginia, Minnesota, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, Delaware. I mean, it's hit all those states up there. And they're huge broiler, hatchery. They're known for large, we don't see much of this, but large duck farms. And they're all outside. So when those migratory birds, they don't even have to land there. If they fly over and drop any manure, they've just been exposed. And we've lost a lot up in there. 
in a Minnesota, they figured out that when that outbreak we went up there on with Heron and all of them, uh, they didn't they didn't start showing signs in their houses till the farmers went out there and went to work in the fields, stirring it up, and that dust floated into those turkey houses and down they went. Uh, any of y'all got ponds close to where you keep your well, your migratory birds are going to come in there, your ducks and your geese. When the oh. geese start landing on your pond, if you've got ducks or geese they, for yourself, they go down to that pond. They bring it right back to your They'll flock. They bring it right back to your house. That's how most of our backyard flocks here in Oklahoma ended up with AI. Is they had <laughs> ducks that went to the pond, migratory birds were at the pond, and they brought it back to the flock and had a huge death loss. So that stay just in the ponds. Huh? And they don't stay just in the ponds. No, no. They're like out in the pasture. Oh, yeah. Groups. Yeah. Right. They'll, yeah. They're going to land wherever there's food. If it's going to be a wheat pasture. So it's wherever there's a food source or water source, that's where these migratory birds are going to land. That's why up in those areas, they're in big rural areas, big farming areas is where these houses are at. So that's where they land. And when they pick up a fly, they drop a lot of poop. Well, even just around here, we have kind of pretty much geese that don't ever leave. And they don't never leave. They mm -hmm. don't leave, but they get exposed to, to the same, to the birds that are migrating. So just wherever you, like I went to my mom's assisted living, there was goose poop all over the sidewalk. Well, when you walk out there, you walk in the goose poop so you can take it back home, just like that. So this is one of the most uh, feared poultry diseases in the U.S. because we can't control it because the migratory birds bring it back and forth. When they, when they go south and when they come back north, they bring it. Right now, we have no active flock right now in the United States. We've kind of closed out Minnesota, Minnesota, Pennsylvania at this time do not have an active <coughs> premise, and those were our last two. They had some in March, and we've got those depopulated, so cross our fingers, no more show up. So we have a low pathogenic, we have a high pathogenic, and we have 15 strains of avian influenza, influenza. And we can DNA test these birds. When they break in a hatchery, we DNA test them. We can tell exactly where they come from or what type of bird. If it's a Mexican strain or if it comes from Canada, we can usually figure it out um, where it comes from. And if you got multiple houses, we can figure out by the strains where it kind of started at and how it kind of moved through our epi investigations. So it's kind of neat. Do you guys do that even for any backyard flocks? Not backyard flocks. Usually when just, we, the, just usually we have one corporate, you know, one after another popping up and we try to figure out the strain. If it's a goose, if it's a duck. Um, if it started at this barn and it seemed to keep going from his next premise to his next premise, figure out how it went. Was it by a vehicle? Was it by a person? Uh, was it the birds? Actually, they were in that flight pattern. So it's kind of neat on how to, how to do that. We've even figured out going into the birds, how, where the infection was even introduced into that barn. Some barns, um, we found out introduction was right at the entryway, so we knew the worker brought it in, because the highest infection rate was right in the entrance into the barn. As they went farther in, there was less infection. Even though it was found, it was going to gradually spread, but the highest death loss was right into the barn. So we knew right then a worker brought it into the barn. So it, through their epidemiology and, and their study, they, they found out some really neat ways of how it's getting spread from one premise to another. We worked one up in Kansas. I had to go up there and deep off. There's three houses. There was maybe 20 feet between these houses, but they were all connected with a breezeway, walkway, whatever. This house is sick, this house is sick, this house is left. From a low pathogenic to high pathogenic, you'll find pigs are great, uh, can great, they can convert a high path, high, a low path AI to high path. They're just like a melting pot on that virus. Hmm. So we always tell people, just keep your hogs away from your chickens because it can cause that. Incubations three to 14 days after exposure. Clinical signs, sudden death with little or no warning, depression, decreased appetite, increased egg production, respiratory signs, 
They'll have some hemorrhaging and swelling of the face, swaddle, and comb, purple color discoloration. The more severe the virus becomes, the more severe the disease becomes. And it's eerie when you see these am- when you see these birds with that. They just like stare off into like nothing. Zombies. They're zombies. They won't move. They'll Visit. just stand there. Go up to uh, York, Nebraska, the state vet up there asked our state vet. They, of course, Nebraska don't have the commercial chicken houses, and turkey houses, and all that like we do in Northeast Oklahoma and Arkansas. We've got a big machine, big foam machine, and that's what we do is utilize whole houses at a time with it and puts fire foam on the top of them. I don't know if any of y'all ever seen that or heard of that, but that's how we do those. 2015, we had 21 states, 232 positive premises. You see how many broilers, backyards. 49.9 million birds cost us one billion dollars because we usually pay indemnity to whoever loses birds. We'll pay you. We have a, a cost of what we think they're or, you know what they're worth. So even the corporate backyard, everybody gets gets paid. Sampling collection for AI. You have to use synthetic swabs, an oral phalangeal swab preferred for poultry which um, that's where you're going to go down the trachea plus they have a slit at the top of their mouth so you go to the slit go down through their trachea and come back up then we have a coagal swab preferred for waterfowl because the waterfowl spread it through their poop so it's it's the bottom end you collect samples You'll swarm the swab vigorously in the media, squeeze the excess liquid out against the side of the tube, currently labeled the tube, lab submission form with appropriate ID. Swab samples may be pooled, so you want all oral phalangeal in one tube, you want quakel in another tube, you don't mix those two. Uh, for a three mil media, you can do five swabs. For a 5.5 mil, you can do 11 swabs pool. You need to keep it refrigerated on ice, on the tubes. Make sure they're, they're on there tight. And a lot of times we put uh, electrical tape around there so they don't vibrate and leak. So you have swabs, media tubes, insulation, insulated shipping box, and ice packs. This is a regulatory test. Samples will not be tested. Samples will not be tested and you are subject to penalty if samples collected with improper swabs improper media, improper storage temperature, improper shipment, shipping container, improper label, improper lab submission form. Tracheal and oral phalangeal swab, but you can see the oral uh, phalangeals at the top of that beak there. You use the same swab, so once you do the oral phalangeal, then you can do the tracheal or either way. Here's uh, Oklahoma Sick Bird Program. That's the number you call. If you have a sick bird, do not freeze that bird. And if you don't want to put it in your refrigerator, if you've got a cooler with ice packs, you can do that. Put it in a bag, but don't freeze it. And let us know as soon as possible. The sooner the better. Newcastle disease. Uh, it's an acute rapid spreading viral respiratory disease of the basic poultry and other birds can be accompanied by nervous system disorders if birds survive long enough in history. It was in England, 1926, and then the US in 1944. The latest outbreak was in California. That's the one he was telling you I had to mess with the cartel. Because in California, I'll, it'll tell you here what counties I, re- I was in, it's very highly populated. <laughs> the virus has three forms. You have a mild, medium, and they're very severe, which is exotic Newcastle or very Newcastle disease, and that's what they have in California. Viruses may survive several weeks in the environment, but it's very susceptible to sunlight. It's an exotic form, really doesn't affect us. It may give us conjunctivitis, kind of like pink eye, if we get it. It's controlled through vaccine, but the immunity is weak and short-lived. The exotic form, usually, this is how California got it. Illegally imported caged birds, game fowl. That's how California got it. And poultry being bring 
disease into this country. Quarantine and testing for disease and others require entry into the U.S. It spread one introduction virus excretion, including aerosol cough into the air can contaminate. Same as the others. It's food, it's people, direct contact. How regular all diseases are pretty much spread. Eggs from infected hens rarely hatch. Broken eggs can expose the entire hatch of chicks. Exposed chicks uh, are put in small lots, can be shipped. That's how it's spread also. And at the bottom, it causes mild conjunctivitis and poultry workers. B and D, uh, usually less than one week is incubation. Clinical <coughs> signs, sudden death with no signs, gasping, huddling, nasal, and ocular discharge. Hmm, what does that sound like? Mycoplasma. Yep. Um, Paralyzed, twisted necks, if birds survive long enough, death in most, if not all birds, similar signs to AI and MG. That's why we got to test, because they all seem to have the same clinical sign. This is where I was at between 2018 and 20. I went four times to California. Each time, first time I was doing surveillance, second time I was doing uh, diagnostics and depopulation. Third time I was as a safety coordinator because they had this group because of Facebook. They were called SOB, Save Our Birds. And they harassed us everywhere we went saying we were spreading the disease. But really when their representatives were there, they had flip-flops on, walking onto the premises. Their, their vehicles weren't clean and seen to eat or nothing. And these are all of our reportable diseases and uh, Oklahoma Department of Agriculture phone number. Biosecurity, that's how it's all mostly spread. She's still using my bird, I think this much anyway. <laughs> what is biosecurity? Measures taken to decrease the chances of infectious diseases being carried on or off. Is biosecurity helps keep diseases and spread them to healthy birds. Protect your birds. Poultry diseases are spread by the people know that. New birds, wild birds, vehicles, animals, transport equipment, clothing, and footwear. Keep the disease out. Use good biosecurity. Separate your sick birds, or even if you bring in new birds. Keep them separated at least for, it says, isolate for 14 to 28 days. Make sure they have no symptoms. And make sure you have barn clothes separate from what you wear to work or at least your shoes because that's how it got spread at some of these farms was they were not changing I mean they tried to do a foot bath but it really didn't work after a while they weren't changing it frequently enough so now USDA has on all these corporate ones they have to change booties so there's just disposed booties so when you go in that barn you put in new booties when you come out of that barn you put it in the trash and you change your coveralls before you go to the next barn. There's some of them, there's one there right by my house that's got grandfather stock. And they'll they'll actually take three or four showers a day because they have to completely, their clothes they put on are on premise. Mm -hmm. Biosecurity bio security guidelines, keep your distance, restrict visitors, access to your birds, prevent contact with wild birds, refrain from visitors, Keep it clean, like your clothing, footwear. Disinfect footwear before entering your barn or coop. Wash hands with soap and water before and after handling the birds. I would say even if you go to a show, those birds you take to the show, quarantine them for 14 to 24 days before you put them back into your flock. You know what your animal husbandry is, but the guy next to you, you don't know. That's what I tell everybody. Um, you don't know what their animal husbandry is. Of, of the street um, is at their place, so I always tell everybody. Even if you go to a show, a lot of a lot of pig farmers, especially do show hogs. That's why a lot of those shows are, especially when it comes to breeding stock, it's one and done. They don't come back to their premises. Um, control your wildlife and don't haul the virus home. Clean the disinfect your wheels. Clean and disinfect all equipment. Borrow from other poultry producers. If you see in this picture, there's a little green arrow that's pointing to a wild bird sitting on the ledge. And then you got birds underneath their laying in the barn. So that's how it can come in. 
these are the disinfectants that will do your job. Vercon or bleach. Bleach is pretty cheap, so is sunlight. This will be your testing policies for salmonella form. Lock and it's freedom from cold. Unless that has to be a typo. It's lock in which free from, she has freedom. It should be free. Yeah. A flock in which is free from chlorine and typhoid has been demonstrated in Oklahoma Department of Agriculture without, within a 12 month period. So we have any policy birds. Um, official state NPIP agency can declare form state free in 1986. Which I think that's wrong because I did do a policy flock that we found. Oklahoma uh, Diagnostic Laboratory is where we send all of our samples to be tested. Poultry four months of age or older at time of testing. There are several levels of testing requirements. Testing performed by a certified <coughs> tester. They use a stain, antigen, rapid, full blood plate test. <coughs> Check test is performed by an official state inspector. These are your levels. You have bronze, silver, gold, and elite. Each one. How many of y'all are carrying one of these bronze, silver, gold, or elite? Okay. What? Policies for testing agents, which will be you guys, must have a valid tester's permit issued by the <coughs> Department of Agriculture. Certified license fee is $30 plus a class fee of five. It's good for three years. I need that on your test. Refresh your course every third year. You remain thoroughly knowledge of requirements for qualifying a flock for official NPIP status. Comply with regulations adopted by Oklahoma Department of Agriculture. You use the stain antigen rapid whole blood test. Don't test a flock under quarantine unless the supervisor of a state, supervisor of state inspector. Can't test the flock in another state without the state's certification or permission, I think it should be. Policy for testing, don't test poultry in less than 21 days between official tests. You will submit all test reports, which is a 9-2 to the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture within 10 days. Official forms of antigen be kept under control testing agents. You can have your license revoked, failure to report reactors. That's a nice fine, $1,000 per count. Discrepancies of 5% or more of flock tests and falsification of a flock selection or testing records. Field testing may test any culture within the state of Oklahoma. Testers may charge appropriate rates as they see fit. Owner's responsibility at the time of testing, they fill out an MPIP application an agreement, participate with all poultry, allow inspection and check testing by state inspector, and purchase poultry from MPIP source only. You fill out and sign the VS 9-2, must be completed and turned into ODAP every time you test, you do a test whether for MP or non-MP members, for exhibition or shipment out of state, Send forms with application fees. Any poultry <coughs> exhibition in Oklahoma shall be free of visible evidence of disease, have passed a negative test for salmonella within 90 days of exhibition, or have originated from an MPIP clean flock. Test MPIP flocks on owner's permission. So if they're going to be MPIP, you have to test on their facility. Poultry tested for export or exhibition may be tested to an agreed location. That means they're not MPIP. They just need those birds tested to go to a show. So they, you can do that in the parking lot. These birds, though, will have to be banded with an official leg band, or you can use a wing band if they want. Test for non-participating birds is only good for 90 days. Owner must obtain a health certificate for exporting poultry out of state, if not MPIP flock. And it uses a 9-3 form. Field testing, proper sanitation, disinfection protocol should, should be followed. Test outdoors in shade or indoors if there's 
good light and little dust. Antigen, allow to warm to room temperature from refrigeration. Do not allow to freeze and shake thoroughly. Keep antigen out of sunlight. Hold dropper straight up and release a drop onto a test plate square. Don't allow the dropper to touch the plate. Test plate surface should be clean, dry between 70 to 80 degrees. Do not use hot water to clean plate. This is the testing. These are the materials you'll need. Um, we use uh, a needle so we can change those out and keep them sharp. Just regular water and a towel to, clean, to dry and clean off in between tests. Field testing. I'll take a blood sample from wing, underside, and elbow region. It's going to be the same as where they collect blood from you. That's the same on the, on the chicken. A lot of times you got to move a few feathers to be able to get that vein visible. <coughs> Puncture the wing with the with the bleeder needle, use a bleeder loop to get blood sample without touching the skin. Sometimes you have to touch skin. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, blood and loop should slightly bulge out. Then you mix your sample with antigen blood on the plate until mixture is about the size of a quarter. Loop bleeder should be dipped in clean water or disinfectant solution and you uh, blot it dry on a clean cloth. That's between each bird. Ask a question. Uh -huh. How come there's no disinfectant between using that same loop? Because uh, if you do that, you if you leave any of the disinfectant on, then you kill gotcha. the bacteria. So gotcha. then it's not going to react. And if that bird has it, you may have other birds that may have policy. But if you use a disinfectant and there's anything left on that loop, then it kills that organism. Gotcha. Testing sample. Gently rock the plate from side to side several times to ensure adequate mixing of the antigen and the blood. Non-reactor smear will be homogeneous. It's, it'll just be a pretty purple. A reactor will clump <coughs> in 30 seconds to indicate the presence of uh, porn or typhoid. A reactor should be, a reactor should only be counted within the first minute. So they'll pop, they'll pop within 30 seconds. If you wait after a minute and you go back and look and you see some stuff, it's, that's not what it is. It could be dirt, it could be anything anything after a minute. As it dries in, when they do that. So a lot of times, their policy, it's gonna be within 30 seconds. You'll know it. Yeah. Immediately retest the bird if you're reactoring the other wing just to verify it. That way you can kind of time it for sure then. Because when you start doing hundreds of birds, I mean, you're just rocking it a couple, 15 seconds or 20 seconds and then you go on to the next bird. Identify the reactors with official la uh, leg band or isolate it from the rest of the flock. Immediately call Oklahoma Department of Agriculture. And we'll take up to four reactors. We'll send to Odom, which is our lab. Reactors, oh, tell them the birds are not coming back. When they go there, they don't come back. Uh -huh. When they take them, your birds are not coming back. Some of them don't know that. And Some of them will snatch them out of your hand, too. What we have done before is we, and it's hard, but we'll draw a blood sample out of the bird. We'll get at least a CC and put it in like a purple top tube and we'll send it and see if they can culture something out of it. But they have to keep the bird isolated until we get that. And if they do isolate it, then we do, the bird does have to be euthanized. Uh, we use standard two glutination test. It's a more accurate test. Uh, we'll submit the birds will be necropsy and culture for the presence of the bacteria. The bacteria growth will be submitted to MBSL for confirmation. So you're looking at least seven to 10 days to get an actual confirmation. <coughs> Upon confirmation from MBSL, quarantine will be issued to the affected flock. We'll do additional testing and disinfectant policy within 10 days from the field test, then you'll be released and you won't have any reactors. Here's the testing. You can see where he's pricking the the wing, loop of blood, that's the little plate. And that's those are all negative. I don't think we have that's a positive. We have our definitions, primary, multiplier, hatchery, dealers. This is a 9-2. You will fill this out. You'll 
over here where it says laboratory results, that's where you're going to put your serial number, expiration date of your antigen, and your test for number. And you'll have, you'll sign it, and then the owner signs it down in there at the bottom. Of course, you'll fill out uh, the top part. Number nine, where it says blood testing, that's the test you're doing, the PORM typhoid test. You won't be doing any of those others. And then on the breed, variety, strain, and breed type, those are online through MPIP. He told me I had to guard this with my line. This is what it looks like. We want the breed numbers, like they're A13. Um, here, you can pass a bunch of Is that important? <laughs> <laughs> well, because you'll know. They want yeah. the breed codes yeah. on these. 9-3 form is for movement. So it's, it's a form or a CVI for veterinarian. Uh, the form is movement of poultry for out of state, no charge. It's the MPIP flock owner contacts ODAP, which is Sherry, and that's her number. Uh, you can fill that form, send it in. There is an electronic form now that you can use, and it goes to Oklahoma and to the, the state of destination if you want to do it electronically. Uh, movement for non-MPIP going out of state requires a CBI, a CBI, which is a health certificate from your veterinarian within 30 days, uh, a PT testing within 90 days, and it will have to have a wing or leg band. It's the owner's responsibility to, to verify the BS Form 9-3 report movement in the state of destination for import requirements. If you go north where we have AI, they may require your birds to be AI tested. I know a lot of them are. If you're going to Michigan, Minnesota, a lot of them will make you require for avian influenza tests because they do have that in their states. Is Texas doing it too? So a lot of states, so a lot of times you're going to have to call the state a destination to find the requirements for poultry because it's, it's going to change all the time. And you know, it's the 9-3. Uh, we have carbon copy books uh, from ODAP. All you have to do is pay for the shipping cost to get it sent to you. This is the electronic form. There's the uh, website address if you want to do it electronically. That's how you fill out the form. That's the not, that is the paper form. And the PO boxes are not allowed. No. You have to have a physical address or I don't know if they're like good. We'll let you put a GPS on there. I don't know. I just, I did a P.O. box for their actual, like, and then I, for their address, physical address, I put their real address, and they said they denied it. And I'm swamped and said, we're testing for avian influenza. These two tests can be performed on all poultry. For Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry rules, this test is only to be performed by a state certified poultry tester. The rapid whole blood test should be conducted in a clean environment, away from the elements. The testing location should have good lighting, but out of direct sunlight and wind. You will need a table, clean working area, tester plate, bleeder loop, needles, NPIP into test block test report book, towel or paper towels, water, a timing device, and cages or a holding area to keep birds in until results are final. <coughs> An extra hand to assist is always helpful. Before you begin, make sure the antigen has been stored properly in the refrigerator or cooler and comes to room temperature before you begin testing. Verify the antigen is not expired. Gently shake the bottle to mix the antigen. Place one drop of antigen on the plate looking for any agglutination or clumping. With the assistance of your helper, place the bird on its side and pluck the feathers on the underside of the wing to reveal the wing vein. Puncture the wing vein with a sharp needle. Collect blood using your loop, then transfer a bulging loop full of blood to the drop of antigen on your plate. Mix the blood and antigen thoroughly with the loop. The antigen and blood mixture should be about the size of a quarter. Return the bird to a cage or a holding area until you can confirm the results. Do not test the next bird until this bird is confirmed negative. Swirl the plate in a circular motion for a full two minutes. 
While you're doing this, look for any signs of agglutination. You'll never get After gone. two minutes have gone by, <laughs> if there is no agglutination, the results can be confirmed as negative. The majority of the time, a positive reactor will occur within the first minute. A positive reaction will have small granules that fall through the test <laughs> mixture when the plate is rotated. A negative reaction will be uniform in color and have no evidence of clumping. Any agglutination after two minutes should be considered negative. Before the next set of birds are tested, thoroughly clean and dry the plate with a dry towel. You can usually do about when 30 birds, birds on a plate tested, before you have to clean it. Form 92 flock selecting and testing report. When testing for MPIP certification, you must send three documents to the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. They are the MPIP Independent Flock Owners Application, payment, and a copy of the test report. Also, when testing a flock for MPIP certification, all testing must be on the owner's property. Remember to practice good biosecurity so you don't bring diseases back home or to other flocks. If disposable coveralls and boots were used, leave them on the farm. Wash all equipment and footwear with a disinfectant. Wash hands or use hand sanitizer until you can wash your hands with soap. Now to testing for AI. Supplies needed are polyester tip swab with a plastic shaft. Cotton tips and wooden shafts should not be used as this may affect testing results. 5.5 milliliter BHI bra, frozen ice pack, insulated box, small zip top bags, and OADDL submission form. When completing the lab submission form, your name and address will be listed as the veterinarian. Under the history clinical signs area, list the reason for the testing. The main reason for you as a private tester to be asked to test for AI would be for a NPIP flock to obtain an AI clean status. It is highly recommended to have one person hold the bird while another person is swabbing the bird and handling the samples. Handle the birds confidently and calmly to avoid any unnecessary stress. Open the mouth with a gentle but firm pressure in the corner of the beak. Having a finger in the angle of the beak will allow the mouth to remain open. Gently extend the neck in order to obtain a better view of the oropharynx and the coanal slit. Gently swab the oropharynx and the surface of the coanal slit. Open the tube, insert the swab, and gently stir and agitate the swab in the tube for approximately five seconds. When removing the swab from the tube, gently press the swab against the side of the tube to remove any grub. You are able to insert up to 11 swabs, one at a time for each 5.5 milliliter tube of grub. Once this procedure is done for all the birds, Secure the cap on the tube. It is recommended to place a piece of electrical tape with a tab end on the tube and cap. Each tube should be labeled in a way that matches the submission form. Once you have swabbed all birds and have all tubes clearly labeled, place the tubes with the cap secured into a Ziploc bag. Next, place the submission form into another Ziploc bag Insert the tubes and the submission form along with the frozen ice pack into the insulated box. That's it, folks. You notice he didn't take the swab and put it up against the tube? I'm cold about that. But after you swab it, you just push that, that swab in inside the tube and just rotate it and just get the excess fluid and throw it out. Just bring it out. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I did pass the test. I did only get one wrong and it took about two weeks to get my certification paperwork in the mail. Now all I have to do is buy my supplies and get on people's schedules. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and hit the little dingle bell so you're alerted every single time we upload new videos. Have a great day. Bye-bye.